Wow. Come on, let's clap our hands for Jesus and just thank him for his faithfulness. He's so good. Amen. You can be seated. What an honor and a privilege to be back. Um, we were trying to figure out last time I was here, and I don't, I don't remember when it was, uh, but I know it's been too long, and I'm glad to be back. And uh, I love you, I love this city, and I love this church, and I really, really love your pastors, uh, who I just think the world of, um, so fun, so godly, uh, just love the Lord, love life, love their kids, love their family, and uh, man, I, I just think, you know, you, you can tell a lot about how blessed you are by the shepherd and shepherds that God puts in your life. And uh, give me an amen right there, everybody. And God spoke to his nation in a time of blessing, and he said, he said, I'm going to give you shepherds after my own heart. And that's what you have in Pastor Whalen, Pastor Dana Sears. And uh, I think on a Tuesday night, let's show some major honor and love to our pastors. Love you guys so much, for real. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. I think if your legs work, let's use them and give a standing ovation for our leaders. Book of Hebrews says they watch over our soul. Amen. Amen. Yeah, what a, what a gift a pastor is. That's what God calls them in, in Ephesians 4. He says they're gifts to us. And Hebrews 13 says they watch over our soul. They check up on us and they care about us. It, it, the, the ministry never goes away. You think about it every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You think about people. You care about people. You're praying for people. You're loving people. And, uh, man, what a move of God this is, huh? This is incredible what God is doing, and, and uh, he's doing it through your pastors. So grateful for them, grateful to be here. Uh, we, we planted City Light six years ago now, and the last time I was here, I, guess, I don't know if two, three years ago, I, I told you, I said, hey, we, we're about to buy land, or we bought land. I'm about to tell our church we bought land, and we did. We bought five acres, and we're actually building a building on it right now. I think, I think we might have a video and I just wanted to kind of give you an update just so you know that, like, we're actually doing what I told you we were going to do. So the yellow building, which is now uh, gray, but that's the building we're building. Now, the miracle is this dirt that you're looking at right here, we just bought that and closed on it last week. To God be the glory. So that's another five acres. So now we have 10 acres in the heart of Las Vegas. And so we're going to put more parking here. We're going to put another building uh, in the future, a, a next-gen building. And so we're going to be like Zion Jr. Come on, somebody. And we're going to do another. <laughs> and that's 1,000 seats. That's 10 acres in the heart of Las Vegas. It'll never be a weed dispensary. It'll never be a liquor store. It'll never be a brothel. It'll never be a casino. Come on. 10 acres for the glory of God, for the preaching of the exaltation of Jesus. Let me just say that because I feel good and I had a big coffee before I walked out. So I got, you know, you're, you're in this church and you're, you're hearing about new locations and we're buying campuses and we're going downtown. And, and you know, the, the Bible says that Satan is the God small g of this world. The greatest act of spiritual warfare for the church is every time we take property and we take it out of this world system, and then we place it into the kingdom of God. And what happens is that property, those, that acreage becomes an open heaven in our city where angels can ascend and descend. Come on, everybody. So we're going to do more campuses here in Tucson. We're going to do more in Vegas. Uh, not, not because when we, you know, when we said yes to ministry, we never thought about real estate. We just want to preach. That's all we want. We just want to pray and preach, Okay. But we've, we've come to learn, and, and it's happening right here at Zion, is that, man, every time we, we take territory out of the enemy's hands, and, man, now it becomes, it becomes Bethel. It becomes the house of the Lord. 
And uh, we're not building empires unto ourselves. We are expanding the kingdom of God. Amen. Because all, all those buildings, um, you know, uh, uh, back in December, I'll just say this. I promise I'll preach. Back in December, I got to spend a day with, with one of my mentors. He's a hero. His name is John Maxwell. And we got to, we were out on green pastures. Amen. We were golfing. And we were, and we're in the, uh, we were in his golf cart and he's driving and we're golfing and, and I said, I said, John, what, what would I tell my church as we were, you know, we're expanding and building and all these things? I said, what would I tell him? And he said, Jabin, the most important thing about buildings is they outlast you. They outlast you. He said, I built a, a, a building in the 90s in San Diego. He said, this Sunday, 10,000 worshipers are going to fill that building. And it's one of the great churches of San Diego. He goes, nobody knows who I am. He goes, I now live in Florida. I've retired from ministry. I'm doing the leadership thing now. And he goes, but there's going to be thousands of people that are going to hear the gospel and be saved and be restored. He said, the power of a building is it goes beyond you. And then so everything we're doing here at this church, it goes beyond us. It's a gift we give to our children. Amen. It's a house we pass down to the next generation. And so... Anyway, I don't know why I'm saying all this. I think I'm just glad to be here. And I just want to tell you, you're in the right place at the right time. And, uh, man, we're going we're gonna to help serve and love the city. And um, to God be the glory. Well, turn in your Bibles. Go to the first book of the Bible. Go to Genesis. I want to read you a couple of verses from Genesis 32. I'm just so grateful to be here. And uh, I feel like I have a word in my heart. And... Um, feel like I have something to say today that's going to be a blessing. Genesis chapter 32, verse 24. I love hearing all those Bibles, by the way. Dang. Let's go. This is a good church. In my church, when I say turn in your Bibles, just all their faces glow. They just glow. I'm hearing pages. Amen. All right. All right. Well, don't judge me. I'm preaching from an iPad, so Sorry. I feel like I need to turn now to, I feel like I got to, let me at least fake it. I got a Genesis in here somewhere. I'm like, guys, this is a Sports Illustrated. Sorry, I didn't even bring a, no, no, it's a Bible. Genesis 32, we're going to start at verse 24. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, this is, this is God wrestling with Jacob. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched, torn, as he wrestled with the man. Then then the man said, I love this, the man picks the fight, God picks the fight, and then kind of immediately goes, now let me go, I'm done. Jacob replied, I will not let you go. Unless you bless me. Let's say that line together. Come on, everybody. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Wow. The man asked him, what is your name? Who are you? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, you will no longer be Jacob but Israel because you have struggled with God and with humans. You've dealt with the God issue and the man issue. See, your life is like a cross both vertically and horizontally. And I've got to deal with my God issues and I've got to deal with my people issues. How many know we have a daddy and a mama and drama and <laughs> trauma and <laughs> we got all kind of baggage and we're figuring out who we are and we're figuring out who God is. And, and, and every one of us is going to have to wrestle with this, struggle with this, fight for this. And God, God says, you've wrestled, you've struggled, you've, you've faced God and you've faced humanity and you've overcome Jacob said, well, I told you my name. Now, please tell me your name. But, but he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he, he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, which means face to face, because I have seen God face to face, yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. And I want to talk just for a few moments. I've, I've now been walking with the Lord. Since June 10, 1998, and over these last 26 years, I've, I've learned one thing, that you don't surrender to God one time at an altar, but you, 
you're going to have to live a life of surrender. And I want to talk about how to surrender to God. How to surrender to God. Because your, your life is simply going to be a daily decision to give Jesus your life. And that's where the joy is and that's where the peace is. And that's where the transformation is, how to surrender to God. Father, speak to us now, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. And so we find Jacob in the text, we find him on the run. He has stolen from his brother Esau, and he has lied to his father-in-law Laban. And now, if you were to read this in context, you would find out he's running from both men. Both men don't know it, but they're both chasing him. They're both looking for him, and they both want to kill him. And so he's running from Esau and he's running from Laban and he's running from his decisions and he's running from his choices and he's running from his family. He's running really from God. Really he's running, trying to from himself. This is where we find Jacob. We find Jacob in the text at the lowest point of his life. Uh, We could define Jacob in one verse. There's one little phrase that I think is just perfect Jacob 101. It's Genesis 31, 31. It says this, I rushed away because I was afraid. That's just Jacob. Unsettled, discontent, rushing away. And yet it's here that God meets him. It's at his lowest point that God finds him. It's at his weakest moment that God grabs a hold of him. See, because I told you that there were two men chasing him. Yes, Esau was chasing him, and yes, Laban was chasing him. But I've got some good gospel news on this Tuesday night. There was a third man chasing Jacob, and his name was God Almighty. Oh, and I want to tell you, God's chasing you tonight. God is pursuing you tonight. God is seeking after you tonight. God God has a way of finding us at, a, at our lowest moment, at our weakest moment, that, that you can run, but you cannot hide from the grace of God, that we serve a God that seeks his people, calls his people, finds his people, yes, wrestles his people and transforms his people. I am so glad that God found me because I just got news for you. I wasn't looking for him. Some of y'all are like, I found Jesus. No, you didn't. He wasn't lost. But he found me. He found me at my lowest place. David said he found me in the pit and he picked me up and he put me on the rock. This is the God that we serve that when we, when we try to go up to heaven, he's there. When we make our bed in hell, he's there. That when we hide in the darkness, the psalmist said darkness is like light to you. That wherever you are, God can find you and transform you. And you might feel tonight like you are a million miles from God, but I promise you he is right here. He is right Right now, he is knocking on the door of your heart, and he sent this loud Pentecostal preacher to tell you that he's looking for you, he's found you, and all you have to do is surrender. And he can change your name, and he can change your life, and he can rewrite the story of your life, and rewrite the story of your family. He gives us a new name. So how do, I, how do I surrender to this God that is in hot pursuit of me? First, I, I have to stop running. Yeah. Verse 24 said, Jacob was left alone. You're, you're going to find this if you read his story. He's never alone. He, he's always got to be around people. He's, he's chasing his daddy's approval. When he can't get that, he's hanging out with his mama. He's the first mama's boy in the Bible. Shout out to all the mama's boys. He's, 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 he's hanging around his father-in-law so he can get his father-in-law's daughters. And he's, he's just always, he's just always around people staying active. I think sometimes we think that busyness is fruitfulness. (laughs) I think sometimes we think, well, as long as I'm tired, I must be holy. <laughs> as, lo- as long as I'm miserable, I must be doing something for God. Uh, we, we end up just moving. We end up just always on the run, never facing God, never facing ourselves. 
never facing what we need to face in order to really get free and be transformed. I, I found that most people end up just running from issue to issue. Yeah, I've been pastoring six years. I've seen it over and over again. Spouse to spouse. City to city. I just got to get to Phoenix. Why? Why? Why do you have to get to Phoenix so bad? I got to get to L.A. I got to get to L.A. Okay. Got to get to Dallas. All right, whatever. I don't know. We go from city to city. We go from person to person. We go from job to job. It's always my last boss. They were the problem. It was always my boss. It was always my boss. We go from church to church. Let's keep it real. Let's just keep it real. We, I mean, you're here right now, and you, you, you love Pastor Whalen. You just think he's the man of God till he offends you, and then you're like, you know what? I just knew there was something off about him. He's in too good a shape to be 50. I should have known better. I wrote, I wrote my little sister on Sunday night, Anna Golden. Did you love Anna Golden? I wrote her, and I said... How good, how good was Tucson? And she goes, they're ageless. That, that was her first response to your pastor. They're ageless. I said, how was the service? She goes, I don't care about the service. The, they were ageless. <laughs> so so my, my point is we end up running from thing to thing, never facing God, never facing me. But, but Jesus has a better way. It's called Repentance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Repentance. It's, it's an old cuss word in the Bible. Repentance. We don't use it anymore. Matthew 4, 17. Here's the, here's the inaugural message of Jesus. Repent. Turn from your sin. But, but listen, don't just turn from your sin. There's a lot of people in this room right now that hate their sin. But you keep repeating it. Because you haven't done the next part. It doesn't say repent of your sins, period. It says repent of your sins and here's the power. And turn to God. The power of repentance is not remorse. It's replacement. It's turning from something to someone. And he did not say turn from your sin and turn to yourself. Everything that you need is within you. No, no, no. He says you need God. He says the sin problem is really a God problem. The addiction problem is really a God problem. The anger problem is really a God problem. The lust problem is really a God problem. What you're missing is God. Paul would go on to, to give us even more insight into this. If you go to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18, he says, don't get drunk with wine. That just leads to excess. In other words, it's never enough. Whatever you are finding that high in, where, wherever you're being inebriated from, whether it's unforgiveness, whether it's wine literally whether it's a drug whether it's lust whatever it might be see we can all get high on the wine of this world paul goes whatever you're trying to find relief in in the natural it will only lead to excess you'll you'll never have enough of it but he doesn't stop there he doesn't say y'all need to stop drinking wine you sinners no he says don't be drunk with wine that leads to excess instead what be filled with the holy spirit that really we have a god issue Really, we have an eternity issue. Really, what we're missing is a walk with God, that we would face God, that we would deal with God, that we would know God, because what we are end up doing is we will end up settling for cheap imitations of the real thing. So you think that lust is good, but you've got to experience true love. You think hate and bitterness is good, but you've got to experience mercy and forgiveness. You think that just happiness and happenings is good, but you've got to experience the joy of the Lord that is your strength. That everything that the enemy can offer you is a fake knockoff. Timu version, come on somebody. Of the real thing. The God thing that maybe what you need is not more stuff from the world. Maybe what you need is heaven. Uh -huh. So I'm chasing something in the natural that can only be found in the eternal. Don't forget that when God created the heavens and the earth during creation, he said, let the earth bear fruit. Let the earth produce plants. and Let the earth do it. Earth, you do it. Let the water produce fish. 
Water, you do it. So the earth, the, the plants need earth. The trees need earth. You take a tree out of the dirt and it dies. You take that plant out of the earth and it dies. It might look good for a moment, but eventually it will die without the earth because it came from the earth and it needs the earth to be sustained. You can take a fish out of the water and for a few minutes it might live, but it will eventually die because it needs its original source, the thing that produced it. It needs water. But when God made you... Can I preach a little bit on a Tuesday night? When God made me, when God made humanity, he did not talk to the earth and he did not talk to the water and he did not talk to the oxygen. He talked to himself and he said, let us make man in our image. And what we need is we need God. A fish needs water and a plant needs earth. But we need God and until we get God, we will never truly be alive oh come on if you're grateful that God found you can we take a praise break real quick I know I just started preaching but can we thank God for the oxygen of heaven God made me and when I meet God I meet life got to stop running secondly I have to I have to admit that I have issues yep even me God God said who are you what's your name Uh, God never asks a question because he doesn't know the answer nothing's ever occurred to God When God says, Adam, where are you? He, he, he's, he's trying to get Adam to locate himself. God knows exactly where Adam's at. When God would ask the prophets, what do you see? God knew exactly what they were seeing. He needed them to identify it. And when, and when he asked Jacob, what's your name? He needs Jacob to get honest about his name. See, it, it, today we basically name our kids whatever we want to name our kids. It's great. Maybe it's a family name, maybe not. But in Bible days, your name meant everything. And your name was a prediction. It was a prophecy of your future. And your name was usually given based off of the pregnancy and the birth and the season of the birth. And so whatever was happening around the pregnancy, whatever was happening around the birth, the parents thought that is a prediction of the future of my child. And so when Rebecca names her second born twin Jacob, It means something. See, Esau came out first. And the scripture says that the firstborn came out first, Esau. But as he was leaving the womb, and as his last leg was leaving Rebecca, but this is Genesis. It's rated R. Amen. So sorry. This is graphic. (laughs) We'll go to Ephesians next week, rated G. But right now we're in Genesis. It's cover your kids' ears. As Esau's leaving the womb, the scripture said that Jacob held on to the heel of his brother. And what happened in this moment is Rebecca saw this and prophesied over her son. This is my heel grabber, my deceiver, my supplanter, my manipulator, my schemer, my trickster, my deceiver. This is my black sheep. This is my troublemaker. Keep an eye on this one. He's trouble. And what maybe she did not fully understand is she just set off a series of events because Jacob would now begin to live up to his name. Imagine from a little child, you begin to hear this spoken over you. This is my problem, child. This is my manipulator. This is my schemer. This is, this is my supplanter. And now he becomes the very thing that they said about him. And so when God says, what's your name, Jacob finally gets honest about his name. One, one theologian actually said he probably hadn't used his name in 15 years. So God says, what's your name? He could have went, oh, I'm, I'm Abraham's grandson. Hallelujah, we're blessed. <laughs> uh, 
I'm Isaac's son. I'm, I'm, I'm one of Rebecca's boys. I'm, I'm one of Esau's brothers. I'm one of Laban's son-in-laws. See, he could have told the truth-ish. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying we have to be real and honest with everybody, but we have to be real and honest with somebody, especially God. I'm not saying that every day needs to be another depressing Facebook post or Instagram reel or, but I am saying somebody has to know the real you and it starts with God. I I can't just come into church and oh, hallelujah, glory to God, praise God, glory to God. You're so good. Glory to God. I got it. If I got to be honest with anybody, I got to be able to talk to God. I got to be able to come in this church and find somebody that I can talk to. I got I got to find somebody that I go, hey, you, you saw me out in the lobby. I was all high-fiving people and everything was so good. It's not good. I got to talk to somebody. How you guys doing? Oh, we're so good. We're so good. Right, babe? Babe, babe, we're so good. We're so good. We're so blessed. Good. We're good. Right? We're good. Oh, the kid's wonderful. Wonderful. We're just so good. We're so good. And I, and I get it, but I, but I got to be able to call somebody and go, I, I'm Jacob. I've got some Jacob in me still. I, I'm not proud of it. I don't like it, but I've still got issues. I've still got some unforgiveness. I, I've still got some pride. I've still got some insecurities. I've still, I've still got some things, and I've got to go to God and be able to admit that. Because until I reveal it, he can't heal it. You know, in James chapter 5, we, we always talk about the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That, that's true. But if you go back a few verses, here's how it starts. Is anyone in trouble? Let him pray. Like maybe you're in trouble because you got yourself in trouble. Maybe you're in trouble because there seems to be a demonic attack over your life. Maybe you're in trouble because of someone else's decision. It it doesn't matter how you got in trouble. James never said, why are you in trouble? You should have more faith. He said, are you in trouble? Admit it. Ask somebody to lay hands on you. Ask somebody to anoint you with oil. Confess your sin. Confess your fault. Confess your weakness. Look at somebody and go, I think I'm in trouble. Maybe I'm in trouble spiritually. Maybe I'm in trouble emotionally. I don't know what it is, but the first step to healing is that you admit that you need healing. And Jacob finally says, this is who I am. I am who Rebecca told me I am. You know, there's a famous scripture in John 8. Um, Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. See, we all know that, right? We shout about it. We sing about it. We celebrate it. We say, come on. We we love it. You know, when Jesus said that, nobody loved it. Jesus grabbed a group of believers. You can read this later in John 8. Grabbed believers. The Bible said believers. And he goes, hey, guys, you can be more than a believer. You can be more than one hour on Sunday morning. You can be more than just Christmas and Easter. You can be a disciple. And and he goes, because here's the blessing of discipleship. I'll set you free. And and so you don't just get to go to heaven. You start getting some heaven on earth. Okay, well, we're all shouting. They weren't shouting. He goes, he goes, I can set you free. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And at that moment when everyone should have said amen and when someone should have grabbed a piece of paper and said, we're going to write a song for that. That's a banger. (laughs) They said, do you know who we are? John 8, 33. We're descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. I'm a king's kid. I'm blessed. I'm a child of God. Well, you can be a child of God and jacked up. Wait, wait, wait. Can we put that back up? Never been saved to anyone? Anyone? Did did they not watch the Prince of Egypt? Where are my old people at? The Ten Commandments? Come on, somebody. Assyria? Babylon? Rome? 
like currently under Roman occupation. Talk about, we free. Is this okay, Caesar? Are you okay with this? How easily we start telling ourselves lies. We start talking, walking around like I'm Abraham's grandchild instead of talking to God and going, I'm Jacob. Oh, and I have a connection to Abraham. Absolutely, praise God. And I thank God for the blessing. And I am a child of God. But there's some Jacob in me still that I need God to wrestle out of me. And it's not until I admit my name that God can change my name. So, so thirdly, I'm going to have the worship team come. Um, you, you have to hold on to God. Hold on to God. Hold on to God. So Jacob is in this wrestling match with God. It's WWE 1. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and, uh, and God's wrestling with him. And God's picked a fight with him. And Maybe God, maybe you feel like God's kind of picking a fight with you right now. I hope so. I hope somebody. Maybe, maybe in this season that you're in, God's kind of just challenging you and wrestling with you. And, and out of nowhere, God goes, all right, I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> Tapping out. I'm done. And, and Jacob goes, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want this to be done yet, God. See, I think God was testing Jacob. Go ahead, man. Quit. Because you always quit, Jacob. You ran out on your family. You, you ran out on Esau. You ran out on Laban. You've, you've run from your wives. You've run from your kids. Go ahead. Just, just keep running. Keep doing what you've always done. I'll always love you, but go ahead and run. Watch, you can run or you can wrestle, but you can't do both. And every person in this room will eventually have to make the decision, am I running? Which will get me nowhere. Or am I going to struggle? Am I going to wrestle? Am I going to stay when I want to go? Am I going to hold on to God when I want to go back to my old life? Am I going to stay faithful to my marriage when temptation is all around me? Am I going to keep my kids in the house of God when it would be easier to just take the day off? Am I going to am I going to continue to faithfully support the house of God when it would be so easy to make ex- Am I going to run or am I going to wrestle? Am I going to, am I going to leave or am I going to stay and fight? And every Christian must say yes to a wrestling match with Jesus. Wrestling with family issues, wrestling with generational curses, wrestling with strongholds, wrestling with my walk with God, wrestling with my future. You can run, you can wrestle, but you can't do both. You know, this church, this church wasn't built by pastors that just ran every time things got tough. I don't know how many times in the last few years since they've been the senior pastors, they've wanted to quit. But I promise it's at least once this week. <laughs> One of y'all was acting up. Amen. I know. You pastor long enough, you find out that sheep bite. Yeah, hey, easy. <laughs> they bite sometimes. Sometimes it's just spiritual warfare. Sometimes it's just the pressure of trying to help people and navigate. And, and, and yet we're here today because, because a couple said, no, we're going to wrestle. We're just going we're just gonna to hold on to God. And we're going to outlast the temptation. We're going to outlast the spiritual warfare. We're going to outlast the devil. We're going to outlast the naysayers. We're going to outlast the tough season. Our, our faith is going to be stronger than the storm. Come on, somebody. Anybody grateful for that? And in your life, you're going to have to wrestle. 
about six months ago, just the pressure of everything that was going on in the ministry, it got to me. And I walked downstairs. I walked downstairs. I just got to be honest. I'm not proud of it, but I walked downstairs. And I went into our freezer. And I took out a half gallon of bluebell ice cream. A half gallon. Half, I didn't say a pint. A half gallon. Now your pastors are real healthy, so this is like, you like get cream and sugar and some eggs and you like cook it up and then you freeze it. It's really good. One day you guys will try it. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. And so I got my half gallon of ice cream and I went and got like a big spoon, not like a normal spoon. I got like a big spoon, like almost like a soup spoon. Uh, come on. You know, you're depressed. Like the bigger the spoon, the higher the depression. <laughs> so I'm just being real. Sorry from Vegas. So I grab my spoon, I grab my ice cream, and I look at my wife and I go, I quit. Not on you, not on God, not on preaching, but I quit on, I'm I'm done with this. So you can be the pastor, I'll support you. We can give it to Wayland, we can make this a Zion Vegas, I don't know, but I'm out! And I grab my ice cream and I just real, just real dramatic. And I started walking up the stairs. And my, my little wife, my little, my little, she says she's five foot, but she's four eleven. My little Latina fireball from the kitchen screams at me as I'm halfway up the stairs. And she goes, <laughs> Pastor, I promise I turned around. It's like I protected the ice cream. I went, it's okay. It's okay, baby. We love you, mija. It's okay. Like protected the ice cream. I was like, what? And she goes, you're not quitting. We gonna make it. And I went, okay. I went back upstairs with my ice cream. And I ate my ice cream. And I woke up the next morning and I didn't quit. Because sometimes you just choose, I'm going to wrestle. Sometimes you just choose, I ain't going back to that lifestyle. Sometimes you just choose, I'm not going back to my old way. Sometimes you just choose, we're going to serve the Lord in the name of Jesus, no matter what. Come on, I'm talking to some people that got some gritty faith tonight. They say, God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me, until you change my name, until you save my family. Until every one of my children is serving God. Hey! Eddie. And he now sees God face to face. Because you don't you don't get to see God face to face on the run. Let me just help you real quick. Genesis 28. Jacob is in the presence of God and he calls the place Bethel he goes I know God's around here somewhere he he knew God corporately but now because he wrestled he's going to know God personally God I feel the anointing of the Lord in this place And he goes, now I don't just know about you. Now you're not just my pastor's God. Now you're not just the preacher's God. Now you're not just Abraham's God. You're my God. And here's this question. Well, who are you? Because I told you my name. What's your name? Don't get it mixed up. This is more than just a name. It's character. Like, who are, what's your character like? And every believer must find out who God is. See, Moses had to ask this question in, in Exodus chapter 3. David asked this question in Psalm 18. The disciples asked this question in Matthew 8. Peter had to answer this question in Matthew 16. Paul would ask this question in Acts chapter 9. Lord, who are you? And if you will ask, He will reveal himself. But watch, watch. He doesn't answer 
by giving his name. He doesn't go, I'm Jehovah Jireh. I'm El Shaddai. I'm Jehovah Nisi. I'm... He, he doesn't say that. Let me, let me tell you what God does. He reveals his name in his action. Who are you, God? I bless you. I'm a name changer. I bless my kids. Watch. I'm not Rebecca. I'm not that authority figure that spoke a curse over you. I'm not your daddy that in a fit of rage spoke evil over you. I'm not Isaac that doesn't have enough blessing for you and Esau. I'm the God of more than enough. I'm the God of blessing. I'm the God of transformation. I'm the God of favor. I'm the God that can change your life and change your name. And in that moment, Almighty God blesses him by changing his name. And he says, you are no longer deceiver. You're no longer thief. You're no longer supplanter. You're overcomer. Because what Jacob needed was God. Jacob had money, but he needed God. Jacob had wives, but he needed God. Jacob had family, but he needed God. Jacob had herds and cattle, but he needed God. Maybe what you're missing is God. And God changed his name. And he said, you are not what Rebecca has said about you. You're not what the demon said about you. You're not what the devil said about you. You're not what you said about yourself in your lowest point. You are not your mistakes. You're not your past. You're not what they told you. You're not your worst season. You're not your shame. Israel, you are who God says you are. You have a new name. You serve the God of new beginnings. Come on, am I talking to anybody today? You are loved. You are healed. You are a child of God. You are saved. You are redeemed from the curse. You are holy, forgiven, free, well supplied, protected, promised. You are no longer Jacob. You are Israel. Come on, everybody. Celebrate that we serve the God who is holy, three times holy. We can trust him. He's got a name above every other name. He's not your daddy's name. He's not your last name. He's holy. He's trustworthy. Let's say that one more time. Come on, your name is the highest. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. It's the greatest. This is the God who can change your name. Take 